I thought I'd speak from over here if it's all right. It's a joy for me always to be on a panel with Lisa back when I thought the human trafficking problem meant we needed to build more highways. <coughs> Lisa was already hard at work and uh, played a, a decisive role in the passage of the original Trafficking Act, as did uh, Laura Letterer, who's uh, in the back and will be joining us in uh, just a minute. Good friends. I think of this as kind of a summary panel. Um, and you're going to hear, I guess, because it's the end of the day, many of the same things over again. But it's a summary panel in the sense that when you ask the question, well, what happens when you have readily available pornography that's being consumed by, by such a large number of people? And what happens when you base your laws on uh, the flawed research of Kinsey? And what happens when you have the breakdown of the family? <clears throat> well, the answer is you get a profoundly exploitative culture. And that's what Lisa and I are here to talk about. We're here to tell you the story of a country that 50 years or so ago began a great experiment, a great country, a blessed people. Still today, uh, the country of unusual uh, degree of faith, among all of Christendom, I think the United States is the most religious country. Poland is sort of more or less at an equal level. And uh, 50 years or so ago, we began this experiment in which we were going to achieve freedom. We were going to achieve sexual license. We were going to say, you know, those old traditional concepts of morality, they're out the window because we're now modern. We're moving forward. We get to define what man is. This is the experiment we began 50 years ago, and I'm so glad that Dr. Reisman was here to lend that, that historic uh, perspective. And tragically, on the road to this great experiment in freedom, we ended up creating slavery. We literally have created in this United States a new class of slaves, and this is not a metaphorical statement. This is literally uh, true. And this slavery, which is human trafficking, that is to say people forced against their will to provide labor or engage in commercial sex, it's a little bit different from the 19th century variety. There aren't so many shackles involved. Traffickers, pimps, they've discovered that fear is enough of a shackle. They've discovered that the traumatizing of their victim is enough of a shackle. They've discovered that you can get them addicted to drugs and alcohol. And that's all that's needed. In fact, that's why in 2000 we needed to have a new federal anti-trafficking statute. Because, as you all know, well, we abolished slavery at the 13th Amendment in 1865, right, following the Civil War. But that law required the demonstration of physical bondage. And so it was necessary for Lisa and Laura and uh, so many others, Janice Krauss, to come together and, and pass a new law because we needed to recognize that physical, that psychological bondage was enough to keep this new class of slaves um, compliant and um, held hostage. The federal uh, trafficking law that passed in 2000 focused on victims from other countries, but it had embedded in it this principle, which is so profoundly important to everything we've been talking about. It said, this is the federal anti-trafficking law, it said anyone under the age of 18 who engages in commercial sex is a victim of trafficking. Full stop. So under federal law, anyone under the age of 18 who engages in commercial sex is a victim of trafficking. Trafficking, by the way, is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not an ideal term because the, the, the crime of trafficking has nothing to do with movement. The crime of trafficking is the exploitation of the individual, the forcing of them to engage in labor or provide commercial sex. So the federal government has said, well, we probably have a little bit less than 20,000 victims a year coming from other countries. But social science research tells us that the number of victims of trafficking who are American kids forced to engage in commercial sex is somewhere between 200 and 400,000. I think 250,000 is a good figure. A quarter of a million American kids a year are victimized, are victims of trafficking. 
profoundly traumatized, alone, no hope of rescue, realistically, no place for them to go, no one looking for them. And without help to rebuild their lives, they will not be able to become self-sufficient adults. This is why I say America has become a profoundly exploitative culture. We have a perfect storm of forces that have come together to create this, this culture. And, and you've heard a bit about each of them. Number one is the rate of abuse in our homes. When a child is abused, and some studies would say physical abuse is even more injurious than sexual abuse, but when a child is abused, they go looking for love literally in the wrong places. A couple of years back, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services collected data from the states and said we had 283,000 serious cases of physical, psychological, or sexual abuse in this country. That's why I think the figure of 250,000 victims of trafficking is probably not far off. 283,000 victims of abuse per year, and that's just the ones that we know about at the federal level. That's the first factor. The second is the phenomenon of throwaway kids. We had a million seven kids who experienced an episode of uh, being a runaway in the last year. 377,000 of those cases meant the kid was gone for more than a week. The really shocking figure to me in this is that in serious cases of a runaway, this is not benign, you know, often runaway cases involve a kid who's spending the night with a friend and forgot to tell mom or mom forgot and, and calls the police. In the serious, non-benign cases of a runaway kid, 21% of those cases are reported to the police. In one out of five cases, when your kid is missing overnight, we call the police. This is what it means to be a throwaway kid. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And while law enforcement efforts based on looking at the role of missing kids is great, we also need to be mindful that the police are only aware of one out of five victims that's on the street. The third great element of our culture of exploitation, of course, is the prevalence of pornography. And that's where demand is created. This is, after all, an economic crime. It requires supply and demand. It may take a certain perversity, a certain sadism, perhaps, to be a trafficker. But this is fundamentally an economic crime. It's about greed. And so we can think of supply, the victims, and demand. Who is it that's willing to pay to have sex with these victims? And undoubtedly, the answer is uh, those who are addicted to pornography. And Lisa's going to speak more on that uh, today. So that's the, the uh, current situation. Now, I don't want to be the skunk at the garden party because you've heard a lot of great presentations uh, to this moment. But if you asked me what we are doing as a society end this horror, I would have to say virtually nothing. If you are lucky enough to live in Montgomery County or Dallas, Texas or Atlanta or a handful of other communities, you may have a detective on the force like we heard from. Chances are you don't. Let me run down through, through some of, the, uh, some of the, the factors that are impeding our, our response to this problem. And, and, you know, actually, in fact, I'll go further. I'll say that if, if you were trying to create an environment which put kids at risk, it would hard, be hard to do better than what we have in the United States today. And, and the reason I want to go through this is, is, is not to be a pessimist, but I don't want you to go home and think this problem's being handled. It's being taken care of. Number one, the federal government. Do not look to the federal government to solve this problem. The federal government is doing what the federal government will do uh, on trafficking. They remain fixated on foreign victims. Foreign victims are a problem. They have given enforcement responsibility to ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. ICE is interested principally in deporting undocumented aliens. 
They are not in the business of picking up American kids who are being exploited. The FBI, 12,000 agents nationwide, 100 of whom are devoted to civil rights crimes, of which human trafficking is one. The resources of the federal government and law enforcement are really not that great. It's actually pretty trivial. You'll hear about the Innocence Loss Program. Great stuff. 100 victims a year saved. And I don't want to denigrate the work of anybody who's, who's making a contribution, but a hundred victims versus a quarter of a million? We have yet to identify in this country a major internet, uh, interstate syndicate trafficking multiple kids. I know that they're out there. I know there are criminal syndicates with a hundred, maybe a thousand kids under their control. We haven't found one yet. Local police. First of all, this crime defies the American model of, of law enforcement. In the United States, typically, if you're a victim of crime, you pick up the phone, you call the police and say, I've been robbed. Victims of this crime will not call police. And so the police have to proactively go out and find them. This is very unusual. This is why we don't have uh, more officers devoting themselves to this. It's unfamiliar territory to find uh, victims of trafficking, these kids particularly who are being exploited. As you've heard, they're no longer on the street. They're being exploited through the internet. You can't afford to have a kid on the street. They're too visible. So new methodologies of, of uh, police, of law enforcement have to be uh, arrived at. The police will often say to us, well, you know, I would pick up kids who are engaged in prostitution if only there was a place to take them. And there isn't. The number of shelters dedicated to this population, again, you can count on one hand. One of the best, one of the biggest, is in Dallas County, Texas, the Letop facility. It's, it's a real challenge to us to, um, to create the, the service space so that the police uh, will be motivated to do more to pick up the kids. And meanwhile, we are closing down vice squads across the country and downsizing them. Typically, the place in local police where uh, the enforcement of these crimes, the rescue of kids, would be engineered. But we're closing them down. Why? Because you've told the police that you don't make that a priority. You have told police that you care about property crimes. The police, it turns out, are actually very responsive to, to local pressure, to community pressure. And as everyone knows, prostitution is a victimless crime. So they're off doing the things that you've told them you want them to do. This is sort of an example of, of the law of unintended consequences. Some years back, the federal government said to local police, we don't want a kid held overnight for any crime that an adult wouldn't be held overnight for. Truancy, runaways. So this, this and, and you know, you, you, uh, you can lose serious money if you hold a kid, you lose federal grant money if you hold a, a juvenile overnight. This has had a chilling effect on all levels of enforcement of, of crimes involving minors. I talked to a uh, juvenile court official in Kansas City where we have a, a model uh, project underway. She said, you know, 20 years ago, we used to see kids brought in all the time on prostitution charges. Last 20 years, I haven't seen one. Why is that? Well, in part, it's because the federal government, in trying to end the abuse of, of delinquency ranches and, and other situations where, you know, bad things happen to kids, um, they created a situation in which the local police have been basically told to get out of the business of enforcing these laws. We need to, we certainly need to, to uh, reform state laws and, and again as Dr. Reisman said that the age of consent which was passed, the age of consent laws were passed when we weren't looking. It's like the day we woke up and discovered the Supreme Court found a right to an abortion and we weren't looking. The, the Kinsey research caused a wholesale reform of state laws um, that lowered the age of consent, and, and what is the effect of that? Who benefits from saying you can choose to have sex with an adult male when you're 15? Can't drive a car, can't sign a legally binding contract, can't join the army, but you can agree to have sex with an adult man. I'm pretty sure it doesn't benefit the kid. 
certainly doesn't benefit the child's parents. This is the sort of legal environment that we need to, uh, to fix, legal reform. You need to have in place good laws to fight trafficking, but we, this is one of the things we also need to reform. We need to get age of consent back up to where the federal government established the standard at 18. Any child under the age of 18 who engages in commercial sex is a victim of trafficking. The other thing is in prostitution statutes, by the way. If your state's prostitution statute does not say, and if the victim, meaning the prostituted person, is under the age of 18, this is a felony. If a police encounter a prostitution transaction, they pick up the John, he's going to get charged maybe with a misdemeanor, even though the victim is, under, is a minor, even though this is felony sex abuse of a minor, because they'll get charged under prostitution statutes. Another area of legal reform we need to undertake. Child Protective Services, they go out of their way to define this population of sexually exploited kids as not their problem because the abuse, it's not a case of abuse involving the parent. Foster care, we allow single adult men to uh, take custody of uh, foster children. I mean, for crying out loud, it's just absurd. And then recently, thanks to the, uh, the leadership and research of Lila Rose, we learned a little something about Planned Parenthood. And I don't think Planned Parenthood is alone. You can go, if you're a pimp, you can take your underage victim to Planned Parenthood and get contraception or an abortion. Now, who's being aided by this? This is our society's response to the phenomenon of human trafficking. This is how we propose to keep our kids safe. And, and really, to reiterate, I think you could not design a better system for the exploitation of kids. Sadly, um, you know, to this moment, I think our response has been utter indifference. And I don't think that we have a society that is nurturing of children and families and persons of good moral character. And therefore, we do not have a society that in, to this degree is pleasing in the sight of God. But the good news is, that the American people are on our side. When you ask people, are we doing a good job of creating a social environment for raising kids, you'll get 80, 90 percent say no, we're not. Is it easier or harder to, to uh, keep your kids safe today than when you were growing up? 86 percent say it's much harder. The Problem is that they're not making the linkage yet between the phenomenon of commercial sex exploitation of these most vulnerable kids and what it takes to keep every child uh, safe in our society. So what do we do about it? Well, it takes community action. It's a hard, in the trenches struggle to bring people of similar mind together in your communities and insist not only that there be official action, it's one thing to put the pressure on the politicians and law enforcement, and that's important to express the point of view of the, of, the, of the community. But we also need to collaborate with the police in new and unusual ways. We need our non-governmental organizations, our volunteer organizations, to come together with police to solve this problem. We need to figure out, outside of government, how we can arrange for shelter space uh, for these kids. And in, in fact, uh, in Kansas City, uh, I'm pleased to report that there's a facility that um, actually is owned by Salvation Army that is shortly going to be uh, created as the first dedicated shelter for juvenile victims of commercial sex exploitation uh, in that community, operated by another uh, great uh, community organization. So these are some of the things that, that need to be done. There's, there's in, in our Kansas City project, a central goal at this moment is to create a council of religious leaders to come together and help us drive the message with uh, local officials. And um, I'm confident that uh, with those sorts of efforts, we can get back to the kind of society that all Americans desire. Thank you.